Charles Darwin, the father of modern evolution, still casts his shadow of ideas over the entire world. Was he a biased manipulator of the real facts of biology? His ideas influenced the opinions of billions of people. Today's media, education, pop culture, business, entertainment, politics, and even religion are affected. You may not realize it, but Darwin's ideas probably affect your thinking. Are you biased and misinformed about the facts? Do you realize that virtually every idea in his theory of evolution has been proved wrong by true scientific discoveries? You need to have the true facts about the world's greatest science fiction writer, Charles Darwin. Stay tuned as we discuss the death of Darwinism. Join our host Steve Myers and his guests as they help you understand your future on Beyond Today. Charles Darwin proposed a new way of looking at our world, advocating that human life came about by accident, without a purpose, and no authority higher than man. He taught that life started billions of years ago from one simple creature to become the millions of different life forms that we have today. If you believed his ideas, he said you wouldn't need God or the Bible anymore. Today you'll discover how science now proves Darwin's ideas are false and why you need to stop that wrong influence on your thinking. My guest today is Mario Sigley, a writer on science and religion and a commentator, and Darius McNeely, editor of World News and Prophecy magazine. Now, as we begin this discussion on Darwinism, how important is Darwin to society today? He's very important, not only in the fields of biology, but in the fields of education. Uh, Darwinism is a theory that has spread way beyond biology. It affects politics, it affects philosophy. And uh, just a short story about uh, a Chinese scientist talking to an American scientist that they were digging some fossils in China. And the Chinese scientist told the American scientist, here in China, we can question Darwinism, but we can't question our president. You can question your president, but you can't question Darwinism. So, so there's been a huge influence on society from Darwin. But, but how do we look at that? Is it you know, is this thinking a, a new religion, or is it a philosophy? Is, is it, you know, a science? How does it fit in those areas? It has become uh, all three. Uh, science has become a religion and also a philosophy. Okay, well, how, how is it a science then? It's a science because uh, the way biology is explained today, it is all through uh, evolution that uh, simple life forms just have evolved. There is not a creator necessary. Then in philosophy, uh, people have evolved their ways of life and that you don't have any absolute values. And as a religion, because a lot of people just tell you that atheism is the religion of the future. So, so in a sense, it, it engulfs all of those things and, and has a tremendous effect on society. But I wonder, is there real evidence behind the things that he teaches? The evidence has been challenged by even the scientific community in, in recent years especially. There are a number of books, Steve, that have been written that have d debunked many of the original theories that Darwin put forth in his book, The Origin of Species. Uh, uh, those scientists don't always get prominent features in a lot of the discussion that takes place, but uh, it's been for a number of years, uh, really, even prior to our generation, that many people have begun to debunk the ideas of Darwinism. And so when we see how he began with his thinking, a lot of that began on his observations, didn't it? It did. He made a trip in the 1830s on the, um, the HMS Beagle into the South Islands, uh, the Galapagos Islands, probably are the most famous ones associated with his trip, although he traveled beyond that as well. But he made a number of observations. You see, Darwin was a, a naturalist. He wasn't a true scientist in the terms that we would use today. In, in his time, in the, in the 19th century, Darwin was what was called a natural scientist or a naturalist. He had had some training in, in uh, the, the, the rudimentary sciences of, of uh, nature, nature at that time. And on this trip, he observed turtles and birds and uh, all kinds of different species of animals and made certain deductions from them based on ideas that he already had before he took that trip. But after he came back, he synthesized those ideas into his book, The Origin of Species, 
but they would not hold up and they really have not held up the critical modern scientific uh, standards that have been applied to science in, in our time. Uh, many of the things that he used to come to his conclusions were really to, uh, are, are outdated for us today. Well, well, let's talk about those couple of things that, that you say don't stand up. What about some of those theories, those ideas that he had that, that just seem to fall apart today? Well, well, Darwin based his theory on two mechanisms to be able to evolve different creatures. Uh, the first one was uh, variation. And he noticed uh, the variation of the finch beaks and uh, the turtles and so forth. And so he, he thought that given enough time, uh, these creatures could evolve into other creatures. That was the first mechanism. So not just stay a turtle, it could become something else. Yes, eventually you could have a, it become a, a, a reptile. And also the second mechanism was natural selection, which is the selection through the forces of nature, weaning out the weak from the strong and eliminating. And he thought that as variations that were advantageous were uh, popped up, that those would be preserved through natural selection. But science today, how does it look at those things? Well, both of these mechanisms are very inadequate. Uh, uh, Darwin did not understand the laws of inheritance, the genetics at that time. Cause, now, because we're talking a long time, 150 years ago, the, the middle 1800s. Exactly, and it was only uh, uh, later on in Gregor Mendel and his explanations of how the species were fixed. Uh, uh, they could only vary up to a certain point. So Darwin ignored the barriers in genetics. And also natural selection turned out to be just a, a limited way of sifting. It, it could produce the survival of the species, but not the arrival of the species. Mm -hmm. Now, when we begin to compare that to what the Bible says, does that fit? Does Darwin's theory fit when he, say, he says that a species could transform itself into something else? No, we have a contradiction before we ever get out of the first chapter of Genesis, Steve. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, to look at the account of creation that, that we are given in Genesis, which is the basis for the alternative theories of, or the alternative explanation, I should say, of, the, of life, God said that he, what he created uh, was, would reproduce after its kind. And that's just another way of saying after its species, as Mario was, was bringing out there. And the biblical account shows that the animal kingdom, the human kingdom, will reproduce after its kind only. And that is something that is, is locked in by genetics and, and by true science and what our understanding is about, about all life forms. Uh, Darwin tried to postulate the idea that they could jump the species and, and jump beyond its kind. And so we have a direct um, opposites of, of uh, explanations there between the, the account in the Bible and what D Darwin's theory put forth. So when, when we read the Bible, when the Bible talks scientifically, Genesis 1 where it says species you know, will reproduce after their own kind, it's, it still stands up. Yes, actually uh, Darwin got it wrong and the Bible got it right that uh, we have over 150 years now to have examined the fossil records and you do not see different kinds uh, changing. You see uh, the, the, each uh, animal reproducing and it does vary to a certain degree. You have uh, many different types of dogs from the Chihuahua to the St. Bernard, but that's as far as they can go. So within the species is variation, but Darwin got it wrong. And the Bible said you can have a dog reproduce after its own kind, and you have variation of them, but it cannot reproduce beyond its own kind. Now let's hold that thought there. There's so much to talk about to this subject. Stay with us. We'll be right back to talk more about the death of Darwinism. If you think there's any proof this monkey is your relative, think again. Preaching faulty logic, for 150 years evolutionists have never proven any living thing can become a new genetic species. You need to understand the real facts behind creation or evolution. Call toll free or go online to see the huge scientific case against evolution. The abundant evidence Charles Darwin got the origins of life all wrong. His speculations have never followed the new evidence. Fossils have not proved his ideas. They are out of place all over the world. Many are missing. 
And with so much evidence, find out what the fossil record really shows. If you think even maybe she's your relative, call toll-free 1-888-886-8632 or go to beyondtoday.tv. Think again. We've been talking about the death of Darwinism. You need our booklet. It's called Creation or Evolution. Does it really matter what you believe? It does matter what you believe. Order this free booklet. Get online, go to beyondtoday.tv and get your free copy. There's so much to the subject. So much science has come to find that his ideas were just wrong. He was a famous man. He had ideas about evolution. But do you realize that these ideas have been proven wrong by science itself? We've been talking about his concepts and, and his ideas. And one of them that we mentioned before was this whole concept of the fossil record. Now, what about Darwin's ideas about the fossil record and where has it taken us today? Darwin was very proud of the fact that he studied geology and he saw that uh, there were a lot of layers and strata and so that there, it's, uh, it gave the appearance of a very uh, long period of time. And so he started realizing that uh, the fossil record uh, could be used to explain his theory of evolution. The only problem was they did not find the transitional forms between these uh, different uh, animals. So they found different types, but there were spaces between them. There weren't connections. Is that a, a different exactly. way to say it? Yes. And so he postulated that it was just a matter of time before all of these transitional forms were going to be found. Okay, so here we are, 150 years later, that's, that's a matter of time. What, what has science found? Yes, uh, they have excavated uh, for 150 years all of the continents out of the 44 terrestrial vertebrates that have been found in the fossil record. Uh, uh, 25 of them still are alive today, and they all appear these 44 vertebrate forms at the beginning of the fossil record so they don't gradually appear. So there were no missing links found, no connections found. In fact, we have less today than we did exactly. you know, years and years and years ago. Yeah, that's the irony. Instead of finding what he thought was this tree of life with one trunk, actually in that first, the Cambrian period, you find 44 of these uh, life uh, forms, uh, the styles of, uh, of body parts, and it's like having 44 trunks appearing at the same time and then branching out. Hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting because as you, you think about that, his ideas were there was a few things to start out and then it grew and developed into all kinds of different varieties, but that's not the case, is it, Derek? Well, it was the idea that uh, things started out very simply was the explanation and then grew to the complex. But what you have when you look at the record, Mario mentioned uh, the, the Cambrian uh, period of the geologic record, which is over 500 million years ago as best it can be determined. You have the sudden springing forth of life in all these various forms. So not just uh, a form or a couple of forms. Boom, a whole... No, multiple forms and the basis for all the, the life forms that we have on Earth even uh, to this, this day. And that's at, you know, over 500 million years ago. Uh, there's a very complex record already there that we can begin to understand. It's, it's not simple to complex. It's complex to complex. So that's a fallacy then. This whole concept of the simple to the complex, life with a few forms to, you know, many is just wrong. Right, and that's the big dilemma that evolutionists have today. How do you explain uh, the previous ancestors to these perfectly formed creatures? You have uh, jawless fish that already have the vertebrates in them. You go lower, there's nothing. Nothing of previous ancestors. So how do all of these uh, 40 different body styles appear? So it would be like in electronics, if you found the, the style for a dishwasher, for a washing machine, for a television, you know, they're all electronically assembled, mm -hmm. but they have different body parts to them. This is the way uh, living creatures appear in the fossil record. And no ancestors. Nothing. They're, they're no just previous there. ancestors. But, but it's also interesting. The fossil theory falls apart. The other aspect that it seems science doesn't want to talk about at times is Darwin's ideas about cells. 
he, he felt that we get back to cells, the most simple thing, that cells should be easy to explain how life began. But is that the case, Derek? The, the cell is a very highly complex organism in itself. O opposite of what Darwin thought. The, op the, the opposite. It, it is extremely complex. The, probably the most simple of the organisms that we have is the one-celled amoeba. I remember as a student in biology class in high school uh, getting some pond water out and putting it under a microscope and looking at these one-celled animals through the, through the uh, microscope. They were fascinating. But they are not simple. They are highly complex laboratories. The, the information that is within each cell is highly complex. The nucleus of the cell, the center of the cell in itself, has enough information in its genetic code that would fill 30 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And the rest of the information in the rest of the cell would probably be enough information to fill up a thousand volumes of mm -hmm. the Encyclopedia Britannica. And that's just one, a one-celled simple organism in the amoeba. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, simple about it. So his postulations about complex life brought about by these simple little cells was absolutely wrong. Yes, that's incredible that when you think back in the 1840s, when they just had these rudimentary microscopes and they just saw these little globs of cells and they thought it was protoplasm and that uh, just like a uh, jelly you could multiply them mm -hmm. you can change them into different forms and you'd get different creatures. Now he even thought that there was something in the cell that would would help things to tr transform, didn't he? Yes, he thought that these were uh, little parts from the cell that would spontaneously burst forth and create other things. So he, this is his, one of his ideas to try to justify how you could get from you know, birds to reptiles to lions, tigers, that and bears. It would bears. just happen. It, would, it was yes. just something that would happen. A spontaneously. He didn't know anything about DNA. <laughs> no. He DNA had not been discovered uh, at that point. In fact, it was not until the early 1950s that the, the DNA code was established. And so when you begin to unravel that, there's so much that he postulated he didn't have the science to show that it was wrong. Now, what is incredible is, although he used these as the pillars of his theory, here we are, 150 years later, using these Darwinian arguments to try to explain how things have evolved in biology classes. But it can't, it can't explain. Spontaneous generation, it, it doesn't happen, does it? Right, that's why there is something behind the motivation of why Darwinism has been held up by the scientific community. That is a great point. There's something behind this whole concept of Darwinism. You need to know what it is. Stay with us. We're going to talk about it when we come back. Genetic scientists now know that Darwin's theory of evolution is impossible. The DNA code with its three billion characters never changes into different species. DNA could never just happen by chance. Read about creation or evolution in this wonderful free publication by calling toll-free 1-888-886-8632 or go to beyondtoday.tv. See that all the real scientific evidence adds up. Evolution is impossible. In our age of spectacular discoveries in science, the miracle of life reveals astonishing truth you can read about regularly in the Good News magazine. As more mysteries of life are solved, put yourself in the positive big picture presented regularly in your free subscription to the Good News. Just call toll-free 1-888-886-8632. That's 1-888-886-8632. Or go to beyondtoday.tv for the Good News magazine. It's tough to understand our world today, but we've got some help for you. We have the Good News Magazine, a magazine of understanding. We hope you'll go online and order your free copy, a magazine that helps you to understand what's going on in the world, help to understand your Bible, help to understand topics like we've been talking about today and evolution. Get the Good News Magazine. Go online and get it free today. Now, we've been talking about Charles Darwin, and we can't help but ask the question, has he influenced the way that you think about life? Experts say Darwin was not a scientist, never claimed to be a professional scientist, and yet he argued that his ideas were scientific theory and that later they'd be proven right by science. And yet, as we've seen, his big ideas are disproved by scientific facts. Now, let's look at his motivation. 
His motivation was not only scientific. You know, he manipulated reality so that people, including scientists themselves, and perhaps you as well, would not believe in God. Let's talk about the research. Recent research has shown Darwin's ideas are wrong, but that wasn't his only motivation, was it? Yes, uh, here we have uh, just one of the books, uh, Darwin, uh, The Life of a Tormented Evolutionist, uh, by two British scientists, and they bring out that his life was, especially the early part, he, he liked to tell cultivated lies, to make these tall stories and, be, and impress the people around him. And this was carried on even to his older So he liked, he liked to get attention, kind of wanted to be at the top of the heap, that sort of thing? Exactly. And so how did that affect what came on later? Was it just science that affected what Darwin did? No, actually, uh, he didn't get his degree in biology. He got his degree in theology of all things. The, the study of God, theology. Yes, his father was a doctor and he figured uh, Darwin was not a person that could get a job s somewhere. So he thought, well, let's uh, give him a theology degree so he can become a, a country parson. But then the invitation came to go aboard the Beagle as the companion of the captain. He wasn't uh, uh, hired on as a naturalist. The, the surgeon in the ship hmm. was the naturalist. He was just uh, an educated gentleman that was supposed to accompany uh, the captain on the Beagle. Now, it's interesting when you talk about he had a theology degree, and yet he didn't turn out to be a godly theologian, did he? No, uh, uh, and also his, the background. His father was not a Christian. His grandfather was not a Christian. Now, his father realized that that was a way of being able to make an easy living at that time hmm. in the Victorian England. And so uh, Darwin was uh, not very convinced and he, he was a materialist at heart, and that eventually came out. Now, now he had some problems in his personal life that changed his view of God, didn't he? Well, the biggest problem, Steve, became uh, after his daughter died. Uh, Darwin had a very large family, had a number of children, and uh, one of his favorite daughters died when she was 10 years old. Now, that, that according to the biographies of the man, uh, really took a heavy toll on his life, and probably more than anything began to turn him from God into at least, uh, at the very least, an agnostic uh, from the religious teaching that he had, from the training that he had as a, as a theologian, and whatever belief system he had personally. That death of his daughter, as it would for just any father, really, was devastating. And really, with, with, uh, with Darwin, I think it's important to understand that his questions about the purpose of, of death and, and suffering and, and why a 10-year-old girl uh, so close to him would suffer and have to die from a disease, how that he could reconcile that with the idea of a loving, kind God uh, began to really cause him some doubts. And it's an age-old story. It has always been factors like that, that that leads to doubt probably as much as any other factor in life. And it did with, with Darwin. And set him on a, a course toward agnosticism and unbelief and made him perhaps uh, ultimately what he was in his year, later years with, it, with what he did on the, the various theories he evolved about life, creation, and uh, the, those theories. So is it fair to say he, he resented God and in a sense wanted to turn from studying God to, to disproving God? Is that, that fair? Yes. Uh, his biographers found secret notebooks he had on what he really thought about things because at that time he was a British gentleman he had a lot of Christian friends so he was afraid to publish his views hmm. but he kept them in private notebooks and he would use the term uh, oh materialist which about uh, himself about himself <laughs> uh, and he <clears throat> became convinced that uh, atoms could self-order themselves and he also called himself the devil's chaplain the devil's chaplain, the devil's minister. Yes, <laughs> that's pretty remarkable to admit something like that. So, so it, what we're saying, he had motivation. There, he was had a mission, you might say, to really oppose God. I think it's important to understand that motivation, Steve. 
the scientific side of Darwinism, as it has come down to us through the years, has changed so much. And as we said earlier, so many scientists have questioned and challenged his conclusions that he had based on the tools and the information available to him in the, in the middle of the 19th century. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is, is and should always be undertaken when you, when you are dealing with these men who have shaped the ideas of our modern world, not mm-hmm. just Darwin, but other great men as, as they are looked at, whether it's Marx or uh, Einstein or Freud or any of the, the so-called great thinkers of our modern world, what was their personal life like? What, what was going on to shape their approach toward the natural world, toward their own, their own uh, specific field of study? Mm-hmm. When you understand that and can bring that into the picture, then you have a, a better field to evaluate their conclusions and how their ideas have shaped modern history. All right, and then how do we approach that when it comes to what difference it makes? You know, if I can disprove God doesn't exist, then I don't have to listen to him, and I don't have to obey, and I can do whatever I want. And yet, here he was motivated from his own, you know, conscience to disprove God and forget about morals. I can do what I want. I can live what I want. God doesn't exist. And yet, it does matter, doesn't it? Doesn't it matter what you believe? Uh, Absolutely. The 20th century, the history has been so influenced by this because Darwin threw out a theory that not only affected what you thought about lower creatures, also human beings. Mm-hmm. And that was taken to say, well, there is a superiority of different races. And that was taken by Hitler and eventually a motivation for World War II. Mm. It, it extends everywhere. It, it does. One of the real challenges for Darwinism, uh, Darwin is thinking today, Steve, is the fact of is not so much how all these life forms relate to one another, but really, how did life really begin? You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer about biblical topics. I write, uh, believe that the Bible is true. I'm a Christian writer. And, you know, I understand the role of faith. I also understand that if you're going to be an atheist and have these atheistic ideas, you have to have a great deal of faith as well to buy into their system. So, in effect, what, what we're saying is that it takes more faith to believe in Darwinism than it does to believe in God. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't send this monkey a card on Mother's Day. She really isn't your relative, though evolutionists think she is. For 150 years, some people assumed Charles Darwin's ideas of evolution would be proven right. They were wrong. Call toll-free 1-888-886-8632 or go online to beyondtoday.tv to find out for yourself the huge scientific case against evolution. Prove she's not your mother. Since the time of Darwin, the intellectuals of education, politics, and even religion have acted as if the God of the Bible is dead. In reality, it is Darwin and his theory who have died, not God. His evolutionary thinking has been proven to be scientifically false. It's left science in a maze of confusion and disagreement. Don't let it manipulate you and affect your thinking. There is a Creator God who made all things, including you. He has an incredible future for you beyond anything offered by the emptiness of evolutionary theories. Thank you, Mario and Darius, for being with me today. When you want to understand your future, remember this program and look beyond today. Thanks for watching. For the free literature offered on today's program, go online to beyondtoday.tv. Please join us again next week on Beyond Today.